so excited to speak to you and I'm a huge admirer of CAMFED. Um, tell us a little bit what CAMFED does. Uh, thanks so much, Dick, and I really appreciate this opportunity. So CAMFED is the campaign for female education. We are a Pan-African movement that's revolutionizing how girls' education is delivered. We are a movement that um, knows intimately and from personal experience what it takes for a girl to come through school, what it also means to be excluded. What we're also then doing is ensuring that uh, girls who come through school also have an opportunity to pay it forward and support the next generation of, of learners. Well, Angie, something that you and I both believe in is that the best way to change the world is to get more kids in school and especially more girls in school. Angie, I have uh, good news for you and I think something of a surprise that uh, CAMFED is not only one of the three winners that I've chosen, but it is the grand prize winner. Um, so there will be wow. extra support for, for um, all the extraordinary efforts that you and your colleagues make to get girls in school. And I chose you as the grand prize winner because <laughs> you and I both believe that the way to change the world is to get more girls in school. <laughs> oh, th thank you. I don't know what to say. This, this is best news ever. Thank, thank you so much, Nick. This, this means a lot. It's, it's a dream come true, especially at a time like this. this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I like that it's not just getting our news out there. It's also keeping girls' education firmly on the global agenda, especially at a time like this. Thank you so much. This, I don't know. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I mean, thanks for, for what you do. Oh. And, and, you know, your own story, Angie, kind of shows how education is transformative. Um, can you share a little bit about, about your own story? Wow. Oh, you should have left the good news to you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, as you know, Nick, I'm one of the very first girls that Comfort sent through school in the early 90s. And um, I was selected by my community to benefit from the Comfort program at a time when I was about to drop out of school. So it was daunting for me as much as I had the best results possible in the country. Uh, the only thing that I could think of at that time, I remember breaking down, was that I, there was no way I could have gone to high school. The cost was just too steep for my family. So that's at the point when comfort stepped in. And uh, when I then went to, to high school, I remember feeling really guilt. I think some people call it survivor guilt because I could not tell but think of all my other colleagues who did not get the same chance who I was at primary school with. So, you know, for me, like, you know, I look at it back at it and I see this this kind of continues to fuel my work, you know, with comfort as well. Because it's not just about getting the chance, it's also about supporting girls to thrive within school. And then after that, you know, when, you know, we graduated through high school and started going to university and everything, we discovered that we were graduating into an environment in a context that wasn't prepared for girls coming from the most marginalized communities. We're graduating into an abyss. No job opportunities, no prospects for advancement and all that. So. We started, um, you know, the Comfort Association of Women Leaders. So from 400 young women, now it's 157,000 young women. So we not only support each other to make the transition, we are also supporting, you know, millions of other children through school as well. And we're leading the, you know, the Comfort program now. And Angie, what would have happened if CAMFED had not been around when you were trying to go to high school and just didn't have the funds? What would you be doing now, do you think? Seriously, I, I don't need an imagination to know what would have happened to me, you know, because there are other girls who didn't get the chance that I got. There are millions of, of girls in sub-Saharan Africa who are still out of school now. Before the COVID pandemic, they were talking about 52.2 million in sub-Saharan Africa alone. So I, I have seen colleagues that I was with in primary school that were equally, equally good academically. I've seen some of them marry very early. We're talking about marrying at 15, at 13, at 18, and they've got large families now. Not only that, you know, some of them are even worse off than their families. They are trapped in this vicious cycle of poverty that we were in. So I got my brag, they didn't. So I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't be where I am today. Probably I would be lucky to be alive. We know that you know, an educated girl is three times less likely to contract HIV and AIDS. And I must say that you know, I've lost friends from all this. And for me, I always put exclusion from education as the, 
greatest injustice that happened to them. And, you know, what strikes me is that that education, helping you get an education, it was not only transformative for you, but it's a way to help others that because, because ChemFed invested in you, then the ripple effects have ended up helping so many other girls in Zimbabwe and indeed across Africa. Um, so it was, it was an investment that had the highest return imaginable. And that's, that's the beauty of education. And one of the things that I really like about CAMFED is that so many graduates, indeed, even though they have fairly limited means, mm -hmm. then go ahead and then help others. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we call that the multiplier effect. So for every girl that has been supported through, through school by CAMFED, each on average supports at least three other children every single year to go through school. So by one graduating, there are three more graduates. And, and that is at the center of our understanding of the injustice of exclusion, but also the power of opportunity. And, and you know, for me, that that's always speaks to the beauty of education, that an educated woman is likely to invest you know, in the education of their own children, in the regeneration of their communities and all that. So, you know, and we are the living testimony of, of education and not just me, but 157,000 other sisters that also got the same chance. So let me just make sure I understand that. So each girl yeah. on average who is supported by CAMFED to get that education, she on her own, with yeah. her own resources, then supports uh, two others? It's three others, and these are three other children even outside of the immediate family. They're not even including the immediate family within that, that circle. Yeah, I guess because they understand as well as anybody the, the transformative power of education. Um, and Angie, you know, one reason I chose uh, CAMPED as the grand prize winner, frankly, was that this is a time when education, and maybe especially girls' education, is in crisis. And I think that maybe especially in the United States, we think of COVID-19 as a disease that kills people or harms people who are infected. But it has also led to a pandemic of uh, illiteracy, of people being forced to drop out of school. And it's often particularly the girls who have to drop out of school. Is that uh, something that you're seeing and is CAMFED able to respond to that need? Yeah, COVID has really been very testing of, you know, of our resilience in, in all ways. We, we know that it exacerbated existing, pre-existing inequalities, and, and one of them is girls' access to education. We know that in response to COVID, countries started uh, you know, closing schools, there were lockdowns, there was, there was social distancing, there was issues around restricted movement and mobility, and that's already on women that have uh, limited opportunities for all of those things. So yes, that's, that's the reality. But also what it meant is that for those that were most marginalized, access to digital learning, which was introduced in most contexts, was not even an option. Not only do they not have the phones, they also at times do not have the radios to be able to listen to, to lessons that are alternative. Talk about loss of incomes of families that are already marginalized, because the majority of them are the same people that are in informal employment. So loss of income meant that even children had to leave homes to be able to look for what we call piecework to be able to survive. Talk about food security as well, all those issues. But I'm really glad because as an organization, you know, and thanks to our country association of leaders, we managed to step up and be able to respond to the, to the crisis. So we had young women that uh, grew up in these communities and thanks to Comfort managed to go through school. So they stepped up and started, you know, dispelling myths around COVID that, you know, already were starting to fuel. Uh, also provided old information to communities so that communities would understand how they can prevent you know, COVID within their communities and how they can respond to it. Because the challenge is without information, people get immobilized. But also what I also like about this is that, you know, the young women also put center stage learning. So they started running study groups, providing reading materials to children in the villages, you know, making home visits to children that they knew that they were in like in crisis, like child-headed families and all that. So yes, we stepped up, but you know, we are under no illusion. The storm is not over. There are still challenges and, you know, there's a risk that millions might not be able to come back to school. Yeah, one of my concerns is that long after the pandemic is over, that there will be millions of kids around the world or at that point millions of adults who will not have been educated because of COVID in 2020 and that they will have been, they will have dropped out, that girls will have been married at 
13, 14, 15, that, there, that those lives will have been lost because we didn't have the foresight on our watch of responding. You know, people talk about the need to send ventilators. Don't send ventilators, send, send money to help girls stay in school. Um, and exactly. that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Um, exactly. And yeah, and, and to be honest, like for me, I see exclusion of girls from education as, as the highest injustice because we, we know that it gives young people a fighting chance. You know, the opportunity to go to school is not, there's this whole example around, you know, teaching to fish and, you know, giving somebody fish. Supporting somebody through education means that you're teaching them to fish. An educated woman, it makes a difference in their own individual life. I'm a living testimony to that, and on millions of other girls like, like that. But also means that for the family, for the community, that vicious cycle of poverty is broken. And so I, I definitely agree with you that, you know, we need to be able to look at this and say, the long-term solution to this crisis is ensuring that we educate girls today because the returns are phenomenal. Yeah, and, and Angie, I must say that I, it seems to me that it not only breaks the cycle of poverty, but that in some countries that are struggling with violence, it also, yeah. it's not perfect, but it helps break that cycle of violence. And, you know, I think about, you know, this is something that terrorists understand. Why does the Taliban throw acid in girls' faces? Uh, why did the Pakistani Taliban shoot Malala in the head? Why does Boko Haram kidnap schoolgirls in Nigeria? Because they understand that the long-term threat to extremism isn't a drone overhead. It's a girl with a book. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, for me, it, it brings the balance of power. So I, I can tell you multiple examples in my community, in the communities that we work in, where we see girls' education shifting the balance of power in communities. As, as communities, as men, as, you know, patriarchs in the community start realizing the beauty and the communal benefits of sending a girl to school. So I can give you an example, for example, in, in Zambia quite recently, a senior chief actually gave uh, the Comfort Association land because he realized that actually women within the community had very limited access to land. And that also had a, re, you know, a ripple effect in terms of their power over their bodies, in terms of, you know, the risk of gender-based violence and all that. But that came from him recognizing that actually there, there is something here. So I believe in practical demonstration of the benefits of education, but also to your point, when we can have women in both public and private leadership positions, we bring a balance of power there. We bring a voice that's usually not listened to. And we kind of create more inclusive societies there in a way, not just inclusive, but also prosperous communities. So I, I definitely do agree with you that, you know, one of the reasons why as the world is where it is now is because, come on, there is a huge percentage of that population that is not sufficiently empowered, that has been disadvantaged for years. And girls' education is the key. Well, I think my readers will be very pleased to be investing not just in drones, <laughs> but in maybe a more powerful tool to bring about long-term change, and that is the uh, education of girls. And, you know, it's also one of the things that strikes me, it's such a bargain. There, you know, that things are, a lot of things are really expensive, but giving a girl an education is, is one of the few bargains left. T t tell me a little about the cost uh, structure, what it costs to, to change a girl's life in US dollars. So I'll start with a very simple, I think, message for me, that there is no donation that's very small. That in a context where the majority live below a dollar, that every investment matters. I, I personally had to work, like, you know, wash, you know, teachers' dishes and all that for a, something as simple as a pencil. And, and I remember, like, when I completed high school, the only decent clothing that I had was the uniform comfort it bought for me. So I'm just trying to emphasize that there is no donation too small. But having said that, it costs $150 to support a girl through secondary school. That's $150 a year. But we know that every additional year completed by a girl through secondary school means that she's got potential to earn 25% more. So that, that really matters. The difference that makes the returns are, are phenomenal. So I just want to be able to say that, you know, don't ever underestimate anything that you want to give because it makes the difference for a girl on whether she stays in school or not. I can't tell you how many lessons I missed when I was in primary school just because I didn't have a simple pencil. So that matters. It's hard to find, yeah, it's hard to find other ways in which $150 just transforms somebody's yeah. life. 
for the you know for for many many years to come and transforms the lives of those around them. Uh, Angie, is there something else you'd like to add or something else you'd like to to tell um, you know my readers? First and foremost, we are excited about this opportunity. It it means a lot. It makes the difference between whether a girl can stay in school or not. But more than that, it changes the trajectory of their family. It means that girls have got a fighting chance to break the cycle of, you know, the, break the vicious cycle of poverty where they've been trapped for years. But also more than that, it also tells us about that we are not alone. I think that, you know, the all these people that are rallying behind me and my sisters in doing the best that we can for our communities means a lot. It, you know, it's kind of like the wind to ourselves and we don't take it lightly. But also I just want to be able to say that, you know, we, we just um, completed our new strategic plan. We are looking at uh, educating 5 million more girls within the next five years. And, and this means a lot. It makes it even more possible and more closer. I know it's audacious, but come on, girls' education is urgent. The, the need is very clear. But so is the, you know, so are the returns as well. So I just want to say thank you so much. We are excited. The future is exciting. The world is a better place because we're doing this together. Let's smash that target. Well, thanks for all you do. And um, I know, um, you know, I, I, I know, I mean, there's this kind of market failure in the world. There are so many readers that I have that want to contribute and make a better world, but they don't know how. And there's so many great organizations in the field that are doing great work and need those resources. And I kind of feel like a, a matchmaker. And I hope this time I'll be able to connect some of those people with the resources who want to make a better world. And, you know, you who are doing that and can... Yeah, Nick, yeah, Nick seriously, your, your bridging means, means a lot. I'm sure that most of them would never hear that about us. You know, there's so many beautiful stories out there that you bring to the world and we really appreciate that the world can hear our stories, can hear our voices and can rally with us as we look into the future. So now keep doing what you're doing. Don't tire. We're not doing that at our end as well. Thank you. Okay. And be healthy and be safe. Okay, Angie? Sure, definitely. You too <laughs> as well. Stay alive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>